Hi folks, in this video we're going to talk about libraries and why we need them. So why do we still need libraries? Well, obviously online content isn't free. Scholarly content online really isn't free. Um, libraries are community building. Um, and in this part, I'm going to talk about libraries, not just in the library at CSU, but libraries in general. And um, libraries join communities together for events, for learning situations, um, story times for children. Um, you can't help but meet members of your community. Services. Um, you'd be surprised what services are offer offered by public libraries. Um, in San Francisco, most public librarians are trained in administering, administering Narcan um, because they have such a opioid um, issue there. Um, and it's not uncommon for somebody, um, especially the homeless population, to come in and have an overdose. Um, they all libraries um, all over the country now offer social worker services um, to talk to um, a social worker for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's for um, uh, food and um, safety, uh, social safety net type um, information. Sometimes it's to help um, with uh, monetary and financial help, um, not necessarily in how to get uh, money from the government, more as to what programs are available to help um, prevent eviction notices, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. And also democratizes information. And because libraries do not charge anything, it allows everybody, no matter if you're wealthy or poor, to have access to information. Um, and that's particularly important is with the internet. Often we think and take for granted that the internet is, we, we think that it, the internet is free, but it's really not. Um, most of us, if you live off campus, um, you receive an internet bill. And if you live on campus, um, it's included within your tuition and, you know, the school um, pays for it, obviously, but you pay for it indirectly. Um, and so for those who can't afford internet services, or if you're in a rural com community where, you know, believe it or not, some areas still can't get broadband internet access, a library is a place where those services are accessible. Now, often we hear, why do we need a library? There's Google. Well, let's look at it from a university standpoint. Standpoint. Could you imagine if a college said to parents or pers uh, prospective students or prospective students to themselves, we off offer Google for our students. Um, universities would get laughed at. Um, accreditation bodies, which basically make your de degree worth something, um, that wouldn't be acceptable. Um, could you imagine a doctor saying, oh, don't worry, I've learned everything I could on Google. It may be possible to do that, but it's not very efficient. It's not an efficient use of time. And you just can't get the authority of Google. It, it's too um, too much information with too much junk to sift through. Um, so even though everything can be online technically, it doesn't necessarily mean it's also accessible online, especially the scholarly information. So we're gonna rewind and don't groan. This is just a brief history of libraries in general. And so you can kind of see, um, especially within the United States, how libraries began, became a real central and key um, instrument within communities and even within the university. 
Now, I'm not going to go all the way back um, to, you know, the Library of Alexandria, but back far enough where we start seeing the first public libraries from Ben Franklin. And he donated his entire collection of books, which was a massive collection. Um, most of the founding fathers were avid readers and were very, um, you know, it was important to them that the public have access to information as well. Um, so when he made this donation, the Franklin town named after Ben Franklin, um, they voted to uh, make these donated books freely available to the public. And this was really um, the United States' first public library. And this idea spreads. Um, after this, uh, some form of a public library um, started forming in lots of American towns before and then especially leading after the Civil War. Um, these lending libraries are usually defined or governed by um, a tax-funded um, board um, instead of under kind of a subscription model, which would be like you pay a, um, a membership fee. And one of the most important things was that they were open to all. Um, they didn't focus on the needs of one particular group, but the public in general. So, but the key part of it was that there was no charge for the services. Um, and at the time, especially in the beginning of the history of the United States, this really wasn't done. And this was kind of um, a revolutionary idea, um, even though there were libraries in Europe, the fact that there were so many, so many sprung up and that they were free um, really helped the United States education system take off as well. So the Carnegie Library, um, this is often heard, especially um, libraries of the Northeast, but he definitely had libraries all over the world built. Um, he was a mogul in the steel industry, and when he became the billionaire of the time, um, people with his wealth looked for projects to um, give back a lot of times for um, the public relations and how to look for it. But with Carnegie, um, his projects came out of a horrible accident that happened at one of his um, businesses. Um, and his uh, projects focused on libraries. And he also had the nickname of the Patriot Saint of Libraries. He founded so many of them. Um, and he felt that this was one way he could get, give his money to the most amount of people possible. And so when a library says it's a Carnegie library, its origins were founded from um, funding from uh, Carnegie. And then as the um, 20th century you know, continued on. Um, library started developing branches, um, meaning, you know, like here in Columbus, we have the main branch on Macon Road, um, and then you have the north branch, the south branch, Mildred Terry. Um, and the idea for this was to bring libraries to more rural parts of the country or, you know, within the community system. Um, a lot of times patrons and even these days um, have a hard time getting to the library for whatever reason. Um, they might have mobility issues, um, you know, having reliable transportation, often public transportation doesn't go out to these rural places. So having um, a branch library made libraries much more accessible to um, patrons that maybe wouldn't be able to get to go to the libraries. Um, and then the expansion of branch libraries in the 60s boomed um, due to um, a significant funding and act from Congress, um, which helped uh, fund new library spaces for particularly underserved communities. 
And then you start seeing bookmobiles, um, libraries coming to hospitals, really meeting people where they are because sometimes people couldn't get to them. So let's look at today's library. In today's library, you'll often find that they're first to adopt different technologies um, and develop the ability to loan out those um, technologies. Um, in many libraries, you have the access to 3D printers, um, different types of maker spaces. Um, often library, public, even public libraries have access to different programs for, to fulfill needs of students, um, K-12 students for their programs, um, for different, um, providing different materials like STEM toys, um, different art supplies, um, and that sort of thing. Um, today, as I mentioned earlier, uh, social service programs are offered. Um, all sorts of programming and learning opportunities for adults and children, internet access, and really today's library is more than just physical books or even more than just ebooks. Um, they provide really community needs to help people um, stay current with the times and with educational paradigms so um, nobody falls behind in at least having access to that knowledge. But with the invention of the internet, why a library? Um, because libraries can bring you scholarly information. Um, if you had to pay for the databases that you have access to at CSU, um, you would pay thousands of, it would be thousands of dollars um, for individual subscriptions to some of these data databases. Um, it provides a quiet and safe place, um, whether you're talking about a public library or a university library, um, you can, you're guaranteed a clean, quiet and safe place to learn what you need to learn and really do what you need to do as far as your scholastic, um, um, goals. Libraries provide access to primary information that's digitized, and this means that um, if CSU has a collection of really historical Civil War photographs, um, we'll try to digitize them so that everybody can have access to them visually. Um, and this is important because it, it promotes different, um, it provides historical context, um, regional history, um, ge genealogical histories sometimes. Um, and without a library, it's rare that you would even see this collection unless um, if they ended up in a private collection, um, they might ha not have the time or resources or even desire to make these digi digital so others can um, view them. You have someone that will help you do research. Um, at CSU Libraries, we have a librarian for each um, subject area. If whatever your major is, there is a librarian there who specializes in those disciplines and you can get research help. Um, fairly, uh, I would say 85% of the time we're open, there will be a librarian there. Um, to help you right then and there, or you, you'll get the information to talk to that librarian um, the following day. Libraries don't benefit from, and I mean monetarily or collect royalties per se, um, for what we house. So they're vetted honestly. There's no one saying, hey, you know, nudging me saying, hey, if you buy these political science books, you know, you'll get a sweet kickback. Not only is that illegal, well, not so much, it's very unethical um, within the USG and CSU standards, but that just doesn't happen. So when I'm reviewing um, items to add to the collection, it's not because I'm benefiting it in some way that, and I mean monetarily, um, I'm looking at it from an honest um, point of view 
seeing whether or not it would benefit um, the student needs and faculty needs. Um, that's not necessarily true when you're talking about Amazon or even um, when you go to Google Books. Um, often they're showing you what they think you will most likely buy. So, um, and then one also very important thing is that not everything on Google is accessible. Um, a lot of times if you say, if you search Google for your, um, research assignment or a uh, paper, um, you'll run into paywalls, subscription fees. Um, so just because you can see an abstract doesn't mean that you're actually going to be able to get to it. And even using Google Scholar, often it'll just redirect you back to um, CSU because it's a database that we have access to. Um, Google has its place, but it's for scholarly research, it's really much more efficient to just go to the library databases versus spending time with unsuccessful searches on Google. Um, uh, several years ago, there was an article and it's taken down since I really wanted to be able to find it to post it, um, about how libraries should be replaced by Amazon, I guess the privatization of libraries. Um, and then there was, so there was a librarian who, um, really broke it down. Um, is privatizing libraries really cost effective? And in the long run, it really doesn't save you money. Now, if you click on this, um, this little chart I, I made from that I transcribed, um, some, cause the, um, the original chart isn't, uh, isn't accessible anymore, but it's just to show you, um, what an Amazon prime subscription per month would be versus a public library. And then I added a university library and using Google. So a lot of times, um, just, just to even use it, you have to pay a fee. So basic access to the public library is really meaning with your tax dollars. Um, and, uh, within Columbus, um, we have a 1% sales tax on certain goods. So I guess you could say it's like a consumption tax. Um, and once the, the fund hits, um, I think it's almost $60 million, which I think that it hit a few years ago, um, the tax goes away. So, um, I just did this on, if you bought $500 worth of stuff in one month, um, that was part that fell into the tax category where it would be charged a 1% tax. It would be $5. Um, per month, Amazon Prime is $14.99. Um, using Google technically is free, but you have all these additional subscri subscription costs. And if you want to read a current title, um, you often have to pay per title. Um, audiobooks, even in Amazon Prime, where some of these um, items might be included, like Amazon Music. Um, not every title book title is included within the, um, subscript, you know, the Amazon prime membership. Um, then you also look at the public library and university library, obviously the university library, we're not going to have story time, but, um, you know, a lot of the other, uh, cert services and, um, benefits of a library. Um, you know, they kind of cross into each other. Um, and that those are things that you're not going to get from any subscription with Amazon. And you're definitely not going to get it from using Google. Um, and it's unlimited. Um, you know, there's, if you come to see me two, three times a day, I'm never going to say to you, you know, you're really, you're at your limit. You know, you, you can't talk to you anymore. No. Um, if you, if there was no library and you were basically on your own to use Google, 
you'd probably have to pay somebody to give you um, individual instruction in helping with research assignments. So even though there's a cost to it, um, and you know, uh, like I mentioned, libraries don't generate money. So that's um, especially a lot of um, CFOs of companies, they, they don't understand a library because it just, it costs money and it doesn't take in money. Well, what's included is almost um, priceless. And there's tons and tons of liter literature. Um, we probably could do like two weeks just on the benefits of libraries. Um, but there's tons of literature that overwhelmingly shows that when a community has a library in it, um, poverty goes down, employment decreases, um, and the overall crime rate will begin to decrease when a library is put into a community. Um, and there's always been a connection between education and poverty. Um, so libraries have a benefit that almost doesn't have a price tag a lot of the times. Um, and just because it's online doesn't mean it's free. Um, there's usually always a cost associated with um, obtaining information. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about today's librarian. Um, today's librarian really does, I, librarians of any time obviously care, but it's really almost a calling where um, helping somebody, whether it's a student, a college student, a K-12 student, um, or in the public library realm, um, we do this because we love it. It's, um, we want to help people find the information that they need and quality information, especially in these days. I don't stamp books and probably I go most days without even touching a physical book. Um, now that's not, and we have to keep in mind that I'm an academic librarian. Um, public librarians are a different story. Archive, um, you know, librarians who work in archives or special libraries, they're different. But my day-to-day -day, um, work rarely has to touch a physical book because um, most of my line is I, I teach courses. So I'm, you know, um, on a computer, I'm doing research and um, creating course material. Um, every librarian at CSU teaches courses or workshops. Um, one shot classes are means um, whenever you see a librarian come into your class for just one class um, to show you how to navigate through some of the library resources, that's a one shot class. We provide research and homework help. Um, we create events. I just hosted an election party um, last week. Um, we serve on CSU committees. Um, most committees require a librarian to serve on it, and we're a small department, so most of us serve on at least one or two uh, committees. Um, we develop the collection. Um, we look at what the needs are of, of the discipline with the budget that we have, and we make stuff happen. And if we don't have the budget for something, we look for open access resources to fill that need. Um, we create research guides and web pages. Um, we work at the service desks. Um, a lot of times departments want us to provide a prospectus report of everything that we have that's related to their department to submit for accreditation or to create a new track or program within um, a discipline. And then troubleshooting. Um, a lot of times I'm the first face somebody sees when their computer just isn't working. So. Um, often I can help with the basic stuff and, but then I have to send them to UITS, but that's part of my job is helping solve problems, um, not just informational ones. Um, and, but it's important to remember that every library is different and, um, each library is unique to what they, um, house, um, their community. So, um, and a lot of 
um, people forget that there's so many different types of libraries that um, um, I even forgot to list in this one. Um, there's corporate librarians. Um, corporations often have um, their own collections of um, technical manuals. You'll find this a lot in software development or um, when something um, requires engineering. Um, they have their own libraries for that. Um, CNN, I know, I only know this, I'm sure other cable news networks um, and probably, you know, regular broadcasting networks um, probably have them, but I just, I know the CNN library, and so I can talk more specifically on that, but, um, you know, uh, news programs have librarians that um, fact check things or provide the information for the anchors to repeat, um, you know, to when they're talking about a story um, so that they're giving accurate information. And a lot of people don't realize the qualifications and experience that you need for a librarian. Um, I have a master's degree in library science um, from the University of Kentucky, but there's lots of different universities um, that offer a library science program. Often you have to have a subject specialty. Um, mine is business, political science, government information. But a lot of times um, a subject librarian will have a master's degree in those subject specialties. Um, if you're going to be a school librarian, often in some states you need K-12 certification. If you're an archivist, uh, specifically in conservation and preservation of you know, older books, they want you to have some sort of chemistry background. Um, because if you're fixing or cleaning um, really old items, you better know what you're doing or you know you might destroy something that you can't get back. So, um, and the experience part really, um, it's, it's kind of tricky for a librarian to get experience experience because it's one of those job, um, you'll see a job posting where, um, they want you to have experience, but you can't get experience because you haven't gotten a job yet. So really you have to get experience wherever you can. Um, I got my experience through volunteering at Fort Benning. Um, networking is very important. Um, that's really how I broke into um, the, li the library world of Columbus, um, meeting people through professional organization. Um, often if you publish something that helps for name recognition and showing how you understand the profession. Um, and you really need at a bare minimum, basic proficiency in technology and computers, because it's just such a, no matter what type of librarian you are, you need some sort of proficiency in that. So um, here are a few links that, um, of some of the topics that I mentioned earlier in the, in the slideshow, if you feel inclined to look more into it. And I will see you in the next video.